At Staples Business Advantage, our experts can help you find furniture that fits any design and budget, while AI can recommend products based on preferences, generate 3D models for visualization, and optimize space planning for office furniture. Take advantage of our team's eye for style and design. And my eye for, wait, I have no eyes. Only algorithms. At Staples Business Advantage, furnishing your office is easy. And with the best warranty in the business, we're committed to you now and down the road. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. This is a Shares for Beginners quick tip. Essential lessons. Questions answered. Michael Kemp is the author of The Ulysses Contract. An excellent book about tying yourself to the mast so you don't follow the siren song onto the rocks of financial failure. Look up your Greek mythology if you're not sure what I'm talking about. In this quick tip, we talk about the dangers of lack of knowledge, looking at companies as dividend harvesting machines rather than capital gain producers, how history can teach us lessons about financial innovation and human behaviour and ways to reduce the inevitable worry of being invested in volatile markets. Worry is a personal thing. Uh, when it comes to the share market, most people are never going to it, totally eradicate it. But you can modify how much you worry. And, and the book provides a number of tools that you can employ to, to help reduce the worry that you might experience. And I'd throw a few of them at you now, like acknowledging that there are many things regarding investing that you just can never control. Con- so control the things you can but it's futile worrying about the things that you can't. And I, and I run through those in my book. You, you also need to acknowledge that when you invest, you are, to a large degree, placing your trust in the system. And the way you can place your trust in the system is to study history, get a really good feel for long-term stock market returns, how the stock market has returned and performed over the centuries. And I mean, the first stock market was, the first tradable stock was 1602, Dutch East India Company. First stock market was 1611, again, in Amsterdam, when they actually built a formal market. So there's over four centuries of history, and it's all well documented. Trust the fact that over the long term, there's no compounding machine that can match the stock market, not even property, but that's that's another issue. Uh, I could get onto that in another day. So you need to trust, place your trust in that compounding machine to appreciate that market volatility, if you have the right frame of mind, should present you with opportunity, not danger. And most people get very, very scared when the market starts moving around. It helps alleviate anxiety enormously by gaining a financial education. It's a dangerous thing to actually engage with the stock market without first having sought some form of financial education, however basic. I compare a lack of knowledge about the market to a child who's afraid of the dark. You can usually alleviate that child's fear by switching on a light. And to me, a solid financial education is like switching on a light. Um, The fear tends to dissipate. The other thing is people focus on loss, but recovery is also a feature of the stock market. And finally, there's another tool that's helped me stop worrying about price volatility, I view my shares differently. I take a different perspective than most people do. And it's people focus far too much on capital gain as the source of return. Hence, they they look at prices and get very anxious about what the price is doing. To me, investing is not about casinos. To me, my portfolio of shares is like a farm that's generating returns, like a farm generates a harvest. I live off that harvest, namely the dividends. I don't fret about the share prices. And I think if you take that attitude, it helps enormously to alleviate any anxiety about price fluctuation. So is is that the case when you might be going through a period of volatility, but the dividends still keep rolling in? Is that the case? Correct. In fact, if you look at periods when the market drops significantly or rises significantly, typically the dividends are far more stable, as you'd expect, the dividends being the harvest from companies' activities. Mm. The company's activities, the actual production machine that's producing the dividends, is not nearly as volatile as the prices themselves, because the prices are driven by hopes and fears and emotion, whereas the company's activities aren't. 
or too much less a degree. And other guests on the podcast have pointed out that it's worthwhile researching the dividends to a certain extent because you don't want to get caught in a dividend trap just getting something because a, a really good dividend is coming up without actually thinking of the I don't overall... Pay, I don't choose my stocks on the basis of dividend yields. Yep. In, in fact, it's, it's far more about the activities of the company mm. uh, because dividend are also uh, subject to dividend policy of the company. I mean, for example, I own Berkshire Hathaway shares for quite a while. That's uh, the expensive ones. The, ex- the second yeah, the t- class A's. Yeah, I had the class A's. A's. Wow. I had the class A's. I bought them at an excellent time. I bought them, I think it was September 2011 when the Aussie dollar was at parity with the US. So I got in dollar for dollar, and I think they're about 113000 a share. Mm-hmm. In the uh, COVID-induced sell-off in uh, March 2020, our dollar hit uh, 55 cents against the US, which meant that the currency had uh, changed. It was very, very good for people selling assets out of the US, so I sold them then. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I had the class A's. But the point I was going to make, Phil, is that uh, it didn't have a dividend. Buffett retained all the profits. I think it was 72 was the last dividend. I'd have to check that because I'm relying on long-term memory here. I think it was mm. 72 and it declared a dividend of about 10 cents at the time. And Buffett, he complained. He said he must have been at the washroom when the, when the board decided to pay the <laughs> dividend. Uh, but it, yeah, it hasn't paid a dividend, you know, 50 odd years. Mm. Uh, when he likes to say, well, what's the use of owning it? Well, the, the, the point is Buffett says, if you want a dividend, sell a share. Because I'm retaining the profits, I'm going to reinvest them in the business. It's been a massive compounding machine. Mm. Massive. So you've spent a lifetime researching financial literature dating back hundreds of years. Is this because there's nothing new under the sun? (laughs) No, it's not because of I I guess I I love history, but is there anything new under the sun from going back to 1602 when it all got going? Mm. So we've got 400 years. Look, we can view that question from two perspectives. I guess either a technical perspective or a human behaviour perspective. So let me address both. Firstly, from a technical perspective, 420 years, what's changed over then? We've got the internet they didn't have. We've got fibre optic cable, satellites. So the the speed and volume and ease of trade has increased massively. Also, the dissemination of information. And that certainly had an impact on professional trading. The other thing that combining computer power with algorithms has facilitated is the search for and the profiting from pricing inefficiencies in the market that a lot of the big hedge funds do today. Again, nothing that mums and dads can do on their on their Apple laptop. But uh, Jim Simons, uh, mathematician turned investor at age 40, that's Renaissance Technologies, that hedge fund, he's just absolutely hit the ball out of the park in his search for pricing inefficiencies using algorithms. Those technologies that have been developed haven't yet had a significant impact on how we actually invest in the Mm. traditional sense. That is how we choose shares. And I I was invited in 2015 to deliver a presentation uh, in the US in the lead up to the Berkshire Hathaway AGM. And I talked about this to the US investors and hedge fund managers and so forth that were at the conference. The way investors valued stocks, see, they all think, you know, valuation of stocks started with Ben Graham, you know, Mm. and securities analysis in 1934, but it didn't. In fact, the way investors valued stocks way back when things started in the 17th century was pretty much the same as now. And you might say, well, how's that? Well, the concept of discounted cash flow, which analysts use today to value stocks, uh, is clearly described in Leonardo Pisano's book, Libra Abaci, the book of calculation, and that was written in 1202. So th- there is nothing new about discounted cash flow. A book written in 1688 about the Dutch exchange, uh, he describes how he values shares. I mean, he calculates them. So it's the same as today. So, all right, well, that's, that's plain vanilla shares, but what about financial derivatives like options and futures? People think they're sort of new whiz-bang ideas, and if you ask anyone, they'll say, oh, yeah, brand new thing, you know, a few decades old. No, they're not a new thing. There are documented reports of options being used in ancient Greece. Mm. I mean, before Jesus Christ was a child, not options on shares at that stage, obviously, but the concept of an option contract can be applied to anything of value. But 
When were uh, options applied to financial instruments like shares? Since the very beginning. Uh, they were traded on Dutch East India Company shares back in the 17th century. De La Vega talked about them in his book, Confusion De, De Confusions, which he wrote in 1688. I've read the book. Mm. Um, in fact, the Dutch referred to options as opsies. <laughs> that was the word they had for it. Now, here's another one, Phil. Contract for difference. Mm. You know what a CFD is? Yeah. Everyone thinks they're a new thing. In fact, if you look up Wikipedia... Wikipedia will tell you that they were developed in Britain in 1974. Well, that's not altogether correct either. I, I have a copy of an act of the British Parliament on my bookshelf that was passed in 1734. It's called the Sir John Barnard's Act of 1734. It's a government act of financial regulation. And in the act, they ban hmm. the evil practice hmm. of hmm. making up differences for stocks. That's basically what CFDs are. The Act also declares all contracts for the future deliveries of securities to be null and void. Well, that's what futures contracts are. So what's new is old. Secondly, are share markets different today than they were centuries ago in terms of how people behave? Absolutely not. And that's no surprise given that 400 years is but a tiny speck in terms of human evolution and development. People today experience exactly the same emotions as those who came before us. Fear, greed, hope, same, same. I mean, I love that observation delivered during England's stock market bubble of 1720, which that bubble was referred to as the South Sea bubble. It was made by a London attorney at the time who was watching people trade stocks in London's Exchange Alley. It was an outdoor area where they exchanged shares. And, and this London attorney of the day said, I had a fancy to go and look at the throngs. And this is how it struck me. It is nothing so much as if all the lunatics had been escaped out of the mad madhouse at once. I mean, it's the same today. Emotion hasn't changed. We're no more less emotionally sophisticated or not than investors were 300 years. So we make the same mistakes as people always have in the share market. Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorised reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. At Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the breakroom products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things, but I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. At Staples Business Advantage, we help you select from 2,000 breakroom products so you can be sure there's something for everyone. Yum. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.